All right, we're going to start now. It's an ad hoc affordable housing committee meeting. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, before we begin, I promised uh, Eddie Latimer that I'd let him make a couple of public service announcements. So, Mr. Latimer. Okay. Um, all I wanted to do is give you all about two programs that are getting ready to happen in Nashville because your constituents can take advantage of these. But one of them is a new down payment program. And the mayor is going to announce this next Tuesday. And I just wanted you all to be listening to this because this was going to do an awful lot to advance people, low income teachers, firemen, policemen. It's going to give them a better opportunity to buy a home than they would have today. And another one is that we're doing a, a home drawing. So some of the homes that were built on the Barnes Fund lots, instead of selling them right away, we're going to enter them into a drawing. Because what happens is basically when we put a home out there in 48 hours, it's gone. So what we're doing is leaving a six-week window open for people to register for the right to buy it. So if you have family members, children you don't no longer want in the house, um, constituents who are looking for affordable housing, it, all they have to do is go to the web page and register, and we'll draw their name out, and then we'll do an income certification with them that gives them a right to buy the home. So these are two things that are coming down just for the cause of affordable housing, and both are in partnership with the city. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank, would you mind uh, emailing the full council information about that also? Okay. To just go ahead and mail them directly or send it to someone? Uh, why don't you send it to me, and I'll distribute it to the whole council. Thank you. All right, today we're going to have um, Adrian Bonharis make a presentation to us about uh, where the administration is on its housing work. Thank you, Chairman. Um, we have been working on the Housing Nashville report for some time now um, and just wanted to kind of brief you all on where, what the report is, kind of what we've done throughout this process. I sent the um, Ad Hoc Affordable Housing Committee the stakeholder comments, um, and some of those comments we're still working through, so they're awaiting response, but I just wanted to kind of brief you on that. Just so you know, the housing definitions that we used in the Housing Nashville report were based on the median household income. When we talk about housing affordability, Oh, I. Uh, so I'm getting a commentary from the back that uh, the screens aren't on back there. Um, no, uh, I apologize for that. We'll send it out to. Well, on the screens, uh, Mr. Jamison, would you mind checking to see whether we can fix that? And I do see familiar faces, so many of you have seen a lot of this information, um, but we're just briefing council on um, many of the things you've seen over the last few months. And we, we definitely have had some stars that have been to three, four, five different meetings where they've seen the same slides, so we appreciate your patience um, and your participation. Um, so housing affordability, when we talk about housing affordability, we're, we're meaning Ms. that... Ms. Harris, um, let's just see if we can get a thumbs up from the back if the screens come on. All right, we're gonna uh, this, we're checking in to see whether we can make that happen, um, and apologize for the inconvenience. Um, go ahead, Ms. Harris. So, housing affordability. When we talk about that, we're basically saying that no individual or family is paying more than thirty percent of their income on housing cost, um, which is what we mean by housing affordability. When we say affordable housing, which was defined by the state, it is for housing for households at zero to sixty percent of the median household income for Davidson County. So, currently, using twenty fifteen, I have not updated twenty sixteen as we just got those last week. Um, but the twenty fifteen 
incomes for a family of four um, would be zero to $36,000 for affordable housing. That would be their salary for the year. For workforce housing, it would be uh, 60 to 120 percent of the median household income, meaning anywhere from 37000 to 72000 And I will say that this is a little bit different than traditional um, housing definitions. Usually you use the HUD area median income, but it was um, expressed during the um, during the inclusionary zoning conversation that median household income be used, and so that's what we use for our report. So the differences, um, hopefully we'll get the screens up, but the primary differences between MHI, which is median household income, and the difference between area median income is the fact that median household income is for the county only, Davidson County only. Area median income would be all of the surrounding key, uh, counties that are included in the MSA, which is what HUD uses as their formula. They also include inflation, which usually the census data um, does not. The census data is also updated every 18 to 24 months. So like I mentioned, we just got the census data for 2016 last week. Um, whereas the HUD data comes in every year around February, March, or April, um, and they include some formulas, including inflation. And so you'll see the numbers with 2016, and I did get a chance to check that. For median income, it's 54310 For 2017 area median income, it's 68700 So you can see the difference there between the area median income and the Davidson County median household income. So just to talk about the stakeholder engagement that happened after we re released a report in May, we had meetings with um, over 15 stakeholder groups, um, several different indi individual meetings, um, and we talked through many of the, mo much of the data. Um, we talked about the tools and asked the different stakeholders, what are we missing? What are things that we need to go back to the table and kind of think a little bit on? Um, and so we said that we we wrap up this conversation, I, I realize it says September 19th, and today is the 18th, so I meant to say the 18th, um, that we would wrap up the uh, kind of conversation and dialogue today. Um, but of course, that just means that we're not going to go out and, and try to uh, tag along on every meeting now. You can feel free to always email us and, and let us know if there are any other best practices that we should be looking into. So this is, there were a range of uh, comments, and um, as I mentioned, the stakeholder comments document is available on our website. We have not put up the Housing Nashville report yet because we wanted to make sure that we got feedback from council, um, just to make sure that we were being holistic in um, making whatever revisions in the actual report. Uh, but some of the things that we heard was the fact that this report really was stationary, that it looked at 2000 and 2015 census data, but it wasn't real time. So while we're discussing all of these different things and the needs and the gaps, a lot has happened between 2015 and today in, you know, in demolition permits um, and building permits that were not necessarily taken into account in the report. And we realized that um, as with any, you know, report, it's, it's usually stationary as, as soon as it's out. Um, for special populations and housing need priorities, um, we realized that some of the data that we thought we would be able to easily ask of stakeholders would be readily available. And what we realize is that there is not um, just a, you know, a one-time shot of finding that data, that it was going to require a little bit more um, discussion with stakeholders, but also trying to figure out where to get that data. So one example is with homelessness. Um, we have the point in time count, um, and there are many that believe that that point in time count is one day of the year, and it's not really reflective of what the true need is for homelessness. That's a valid point. Um, and so now the question is, how do we make sure that we're getting down to the data that helps us project what the actual need is? And so that'll be an action strategy that we have as a part of the action plan, but we don't have that data today. There were some changes to the housing need pro needs priorities, and um, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, discussion related to the appropriate location of housing. We've had many discussions about where affordable and workforce housing should go and where it should not go. What we would like is that there be affordable workforce housing in every um, 
neighborhood in Nashville so that we do have mixed income communities, but there are some thoughts about where they actually should go. Um, additionally, and I'm only just picking up a few of these comments, but you can read the actual doc document. It will, it, their comments were all over the, the board. Um, and one of the things we initially had in the toolkit um, was we didn't have responsible entities listed as to who was responsible for what tool. Um, and so we've gone back in and made sure that we've added what responsible entity is responsible for that actual funding. So if it's Community Development Block Grant, although it is a Metro Nashville funding program, it is administered by MDHA. So you will see Metro and MDHA because they are the two responsible entities. And lastly, there was some discussion about um, one of the places where the appropriate location of housing should be was um, many people believe that it should be along the transit corridors um, in, the, in the form of transit-oriented development, but also just making sure that it's not sprinkled into um, the neighborhood if it's already well-defined. So as we move toward implementation, uh, we will be going back over those comments. I'm so glad that we took notes of the comments. If any of the stakeholders in the audience notice that we didn't have comments in there, please let us know, because we want to make sure that we have this information so that we can go back and forth um, as we're implementing. <clears throat> Excuse me. So just to go into the outline um, quickly, one of the, we started out with the purpose, we talked about the state of affordable housing in Nashville and provided key findings. We also presented the housing needs and gaps analysis, which I mentioned was based on 2000 and 2015 census data. Um, and then we've worked with the Tennessee Housing Development Agency, which is a, we've had this partnership all along, but we've defined our partnership in the sense that they have a research and planning team and they could help us with um, getting a lot of the housing information that we needed. They were also planning to do this anyway for all of the big four cities in Tennessee. Um, and so we've established a relationship with them where they're gonna provide these housing indicators annually. Uh, we've also added a 2018 housing action plan and reported on activities from last year's budget, um, which provided units um, and the amount of funding allocated for each program. And then at the end, there was a housing terms and the start of a resource guide um, and some additional information. This graphic was actually included in the report. This is just a snapshot of the state of housing in Nashville, basically, and this is based off of 2015. So if we went back, the population in Davidson County would, be, uh, would increase. But what we've seen is a 23% population increase from 2005 to 2015. And that housing cost burden is um, the percent of residents. Um, and so that means that we're affecting a lot, there's a lot of people that cannot afford housing right now. With the supply demand gaps analysis, we basically found out that we've lost more than 20% of our affordable housing stock in 15 years. Not in one year, not in two years, but over 15 years, we've lost 18,000 units. And that if we're not doing anything more, um, then that could grow to 31,000 units a year. Now, that was based off of, again, 2015, um, and this was done right as we were starting to do some new programming um, and right as council was approving, I think, the first, or, uh, the first allocation of um, $10 million to the Barnes Fund. This is the key findings from the Housing Nashville report. Many of the folks in the audience have seen the slide over and over, um, but it's basically just mentioning the fact that nearly one out of four homeowners um, are, is cost burden. Um, cost burden meaning, meaning that they're paying more than 30% of their income on housing. Um, that there was an owner household supply demand gap of over 3,300 units for incomes below 30%. So what that means to us is that people that are between zero to 30% that are currently owning their homes, it's the housing cost for them is cost burden for them is the fact that they're on fixed incomes and may not be able to rehab or repair their homes or make modifications to their homes, which means that we really need to be focused on preserving that affordability. Um, additionally, there was a dollar amount assigned to this cost burden that if we, ha uh, that if, 
So over $345 million um, would be recirculated in a local economy if households were not paying more than 30% of their household, 30% uh, of their income on housing. Right now, if you're paying 30% of your income, you're not necessarily able to go out to stores and shop and get your medical needs or um, be able to use transportation options in a way that you would like. So that's what that, that number means. Additionally, um, there was an estimated 2,000 unit surplus in 2000 for affordable rentals. By 2015, that surplus had become a deficit of 18,000 units. That's what that 18,000 number is. And so it goes back to the fact that if we're not doing anything else, um, that that can increase to 31,000 by 2025. As I mentioned, we have a partnership with the with THDA, the State Housing Financing Agency, for housing indicators. So they provided us some uh, standard data for housing demand for housing cost, for population and housing, owner versus renter households, and access and affordability. And that section is all in there that they're planning to update annually. They'll tell us if, how we're doing based off of um, what the 2016 census data um, is, is telling us. And so what one of the um, snippets in that section basically says that a firefighter makes about $41,000 and he's currently not able to afford uh, a home if he were looking to buy a home in Nashville right now. So getting into the action plan, many of you already know that the housing strategy is to fund, to build and preserve housing while we're retaining residents from unhealthy um, living conditions. So this is the strategy. This is what we plan to do going forward, is to continue to fund, build, preserve housing. That's how we continue this strategy of increasing affordable housing units. By retaining residents, working on housing affordability and re retention of residents, we're basically saying we need to make sure that we are expanding uh, rehab and rehabil rehabilitation and repair services, um, that we're also thinking about the tax freeze programs going forward. Um, so being very intentional about how are we creating an anti-displacement strategy for these residents. The policy recommendations are listed, and as you, as you all know, we had, I can't even remember the number of housing plans or recommendations from other plans that we looked at to get to our policy recommendations. We initially had a document of 64 pages that kind of just brought in all of the housing data, all of the housing policy recommendations. And what we realized is that there was a lot of redundancy um, and so we have gotten to these five based off of um, review of all of those reports. Um, and our interns, I will say, have been very helpful um, going through those documents and, telling, and pulling out that information. So I'll read them because I'm not sure if they're on the screens there yet. Uh, Number one is increase housing choices that are affordable, available, and accessible to all new and existing Nashvillians, maintaining economic and social diversity. Number two is reduce the negative effects of gentrification and displacement in Nashville's growing residential markets. Number three is promote strong community networks in Nashville's neighborhoods that include residents, supportive organizations, and services. Number four is to ensure that all neighborhoods have access to opportunities and high quality housing options through equitable investment and development. And number five is emphasize green building, energy efficiency and healthy housing principles in housing construction and rehabilitation. So a mouthful, but really those are the five policy recommendations that we heard as the themes throughout all of the planning documents that we review. With housing need priorities, um, so we started out with extremely low income households and that was really the major one that we had um, that included zero to 30% of the median household income, individuals and families. When we were going through the stakeholder process, one of the things we heard was that you need to include or take persons experiencing homelessness as a separate uh, housing need priority. And so we've taken that out as a, made sure that it's um, upfront as one of the housing need priorities. 
seniors, new Americans, disabled veterans, youth, formerly incarcerated are all ones that we had in there before, but we've added now victims of domestic violence and inter and multi-generational families. And that came with the definition of families with children, but also the fact that grandparents raising grandchildren, um, it's something that we're coming up on with federal requirements, for instance. So if somebody has a senior housing, uh, if they're living in senior housing right now and they have, if they're gonna raise their grandchild, children are not currently allowed in some of the senior housing facilities. So those are things that just needs to be considered as we're thinking about housing development, that it, when we say seniors, it doesn't necessarily mean a one bedroom unit. It may mean that we need to be thinking about two or three bedroom units. Um, and lastly, creatives and artists was one that we got the first bit of um, commentary on um, because there was some concern about us calling it out as a separate housing need. The reason why I was initially on there was we heard loud and clear from the creative community that Nashville is Music City and that um, there are a lot of artists that may receive um, a one-time payment for their art in the summer. They may get $20,000 for their artwork and that's all they get for the year. And so there was, um, they wanted some consideration about how artists may need to be looked at a little bit differently because they may not have monthly stubs like uh, a person that's working a job that gets something, uh, get a payment monthly. But throughout our stakeholder commentary, we heard even from artists and creatives of we may not necessarily need a separate housing need priority because we may be able to afford the housing. It's just we want to make sure that as there is affordable and workforce housing that we, we do, um, that with the increase of affordable and workforce housing units, we'll be able to apply for those. So we took it out of the housing need priorities because they basically said we can go to any affordable and workforce housing unit um, if we're eligible. The location strategy is something that we are talking about and will continue to talk about. I don't think this will be something that we can totally outline um, as the plan moving forward, just because it does require quite a bit more um, work and discussion. Transit-oriented development is one that we continuously heard um, and we've seen in other cities as being both a tool for increased affordable housing, but we do understand that there could be some um, the, there could be increases in property values, so there could also be some displacement. So we're gonna have to think about anti-displacement strategies um, while we're also increasing them. One thing that we do know is that with the last piece of legislation that was approved by the state, um, that now TIF, or tax in increment financing, can be used for affordable and workforce housing, which it wasn't before. So there is a tool that can finance new affordable housing, but we do have to be intentional about how we keep affordable housing in the areas where there is projected transit. So um, there, we've always said that there should be more affordable and workforce housing along high capacity corridors and multimodal corridors. So Gallatin Pike, Murfreesboro Pike, Nolansville Pike. Those are ones that could receive a bit more density um, that would allow for an increase in those units. The whole purpose of that is to make sure that individuals and families are near transit centers and or near employment centers um, and kind of mirrors the tiered centers from the Nashville Next um, plan. The Nashville Promise Zone, which um, some of you may be familiar with, was um, we were designated um, in this last round. Um, I think we were round three, and it's basically it, it identified the highest poverty areas in Nashville, and there are six subzones. Um, and we I see we have some of the partners, a couple of partners in the audience. Um, it's basically Edge Hill, um, East Nashville, Southeast Nashville. There are six different ones, and we have a map included in the House, Housing Nashville report that shows where these areas are. One of the goals of the Promise Zone is to increase affordable housing choices. Um, and so knowing that that's one of the goals of the Promise Zone, we made sure that it was included in there. But one of the things that we wanted to add is we know that um, we couldn't continue to do this work and further 
concentration of poverty. That's something that Reverend Barnes and um, we've heard all along. So we wanted to make sure that if a nonprofit developer or a private developer was ever interested in creating additional housing units below 30% of the median household income, that they have a plan for services. Because typically, folks at zero to 30% um, may need additional services or connection to services. Um, and so that way, at least if you are planning to provide additional um, units at below 30%, which is usually poverty um, level, that you are at least thinking about how you can connect the housing units to those services. We, we are encouraging, though, um, developers to provide housing units over 30% so that people that want to transition out of poverty have some additional units um, so that they can be closer to their support services. So the whole idea is let's make sure that we're creating housing opportunities and creating those opportunities in the, in the gaps. Um, so the last point is areas of high opportunity. Um, some of you may have been involved in the assessment of fair housing. This is why this conversation still needs to happen. Uh, we want to make sure that we are really thinking about where housing opportunities happen, but that we continue in this discussion of not just always having the housing development in the same areas, that we are trying to be strategic in making sure that housing opportunities are countywide, not just in one council district, but um, as many council districts as possible. So to wrap up kind of what we heard, and I do have a few more slides, but I'm gonna try to go a little bit quicker. Uh, to wrap it up, basically, we need to prioritize affordable rental housing. Um, home ownership is very important, but when we have a report that says we've lost 18,000 affordable rentals, it's hard for us not to have some prioritization of affordable rental. Um, additionally, that's going to require us to have some um, coordination with Metro departments. Um, we're going to have to talk to stakeholders to help us kind of get the messaging around what affordable rental looks like. Um, because we do, we don't like to talk about it, but we do have a lot of NIMBYism um, that we're trying to convert to YIMBYism. If Pearl Sims is in the audience, um, she, she would be yelling that from um, the mountaintops. So, we also need to focus on anti-displacement strategies. Uh, one of the things that we're working on right now is a healthy housing initiative. We're working with the codes department and health department to figure out how they can talk a little bit more. So if a house has mold in it and the health department knows about it, how can the health department also know that they may, or how can codes also know that they need to maybe do some inspection as well? Um, additionally, how do we reduce housing cost burden? It's one thing to say that somebody is paying 30% of their income on housing, but um, the Housing and Transportation Index says that um, Nashvilleians are paying about 23% of their income on transportation. So if you add in a 30% of their income on housing and then an additional 23%, we're already at over 50%. But then you go into utilities, and we're one of the highest cost um, utility districts as well. So it's, you start to eat away at um, the incomes, and you start to get to low to moderate income households, and they have nothing to spare um, after their housing and transportation cost. And then lastly, um, we have to alleviate the pressure from concentrated areas of poverty and low-income households. So how do we make sure that when tax credit developments come into Nashville, how do we make sure that they're not all concentrated right around each other? How do we make sure that we're working with THDA um, and developers to be a little bit more intentional with their development approaches? You all know about the housing toolkit. I don't think I need to go into a lot of that. Um, these are ones that are that have been on the books, I guess, for the last um, few years. Um, and they are the ones that have really um, started the conversation um, with affordable and workforce housing. I would say the, the Barnes Fund for Affordable Housing is the one that's geared for nonprofit organizations. And we've seen a great amount of work around that. Um, and we do have some partners also here today. Um, we are working through the inclusionary zoning and the housing incentives pilot program and should hopefully have some legislation soon of some developers who are very interested in that program.
And I should mention that the Metro properties, we currently have donated uh, over 40 infill lots for affordable either home ownership or rental. So the program that um, Eddie mentioned earlier is um, the fact that those properties were donated to affordable housing rent, uh, resources for home ownership opportunities. These are other programs, and there's a longer list in the Housing Nashville report that we're developing. Um, since I've met with stakeholders, I've also met with um, the city of Austin's housing department, and they were very helpful um, with their strategic blueprint that they completed recently. What they said they did was they listed all of the different ways that developers could increase affordable housing opportunities. And one thing that I realized when we went back to the report is that we didn't list all of the ones. We listed the ones that Metro may have had some involvement in, but not all of the state programs, the federal programs. Um, and so we did um, try to be a little bit more um, thoughtful about which ones we should include. For instance, we didn't have density bonuses listed in the Housing National Report when we went out to the stakeholder group, but that is a tool that's currently not being used, but it's a tool that's available. Um, and so we're trying to make sure that we expand that list a little bit more so developers know what's available. We are working, you'll see one at the very bottom, the Housing Nashville software is one that, one thing we realize is that we're working on all of these programs and initiatives right now in the um, mayor's office and um, we get a lot of calls about, we just heard that um, somebody is opening, um, there was a groundbreaking for housing, where is it, how do we get to it, uh, we wanna apply for it. So the housing navigation software would be a way for people to easily apply for housing and could help with homelessness um, as a housing crisis um, resolution system. So we're working on some software that may be helpful for people to actually get to the units themselves. Um, just to give you some ideas that came out of the stakeholder meetings, more discussion um, came up about employer-assisted housing. Um, in, I think it's um, Google, Google has done some housing for their employees. Um, there have been many employers that have provided housing for their actual employees, and that came up a couple times. Um, the use of geo bonds, um, one interesting dynamic that came out, maybe some type of citizen participation social bond idea. Um, I'm not quite sure if we, we can do that, but those are some of the ideas that came out through the process. Um, senior co-sharing and co-living. One thing that people talked about is, you know, they, they heard the idea of tiny homes and micro units for home ownership. Um, and um, some of the seniors said, well, I may have an issue with um, letting go of some of my things. I don't, I'm emotionally and socially attached really to my home and all of the connections around me, but I'd be willing to maybe, um, you know, sublease one of my bedrooms for maybe a college student or sublet, um, you know, something where there could be some kind of co-sharing, co-living idea. Um, modular housing has come up several times as it's a way to possibly reduce the cost of housing construction. Um, and as I mentioned, micro units for home ownership as well as homelessness. So two different, two very different ideas, um, but both have been used in different cities. And then this is not the long list of toolkit ideas. These are just a range of some. Um, but lastly, the resource guide was a consistent uh, request that the community um, mentioned in just just about every meeting we went to. They felt like there was no consolidated guide that would help somebody know where to go if they wanted to look for a three bedroom or if they needed um, home buyer counseling education classes. Um, and so we are working with um, an intern in our office now, but also um, working to develop what that resource guide looks like and making sure that we're not duplicating efforts. So um, we will be working to see if that's something that we need to um, continue work on. So the accomplishments, um, as I've mentioned, we have done 
a lot um, in the last couple of years. We have Morgan Mansa and Major Mansa in the back who, um, Morgan is now full-time staff for the um, Barnes Housing Trust Fund Commission, which we're very happy to have. And since then, we've had nonprofit participation increase by over 50%. Um, and we continue to get calls from newer nonprofits um, and the, even some nonprofits that haven't really been in the housing development world in a while and wants to kind of get back in it. So Morgan has been meeting a lot with nonprofits going out on sites and trying to figure out how do we make sure that we're expanding nonprofit capacity building. Additionally, there has been a commitment of $70 million to affordable housing development to date. Um, we have the $15 million um, that's already been kind of committed and expended. Well, $5 million of that will be coming to you soon. I shouldn't say expended yet. Um, but $10 million has been expended. The $5 million in the innovation round will be coming to you in the coming weeks, um, hopefully for approval. And then the $10 million is currently out to date. So nonprofits can apply online today um, if they have a housing development project that they're interested in increasing affordable housing or even preserving affordable housing, you can apply today until October 23rd. The applications end and then the commission will vote on um, the recommended proposals. $25 million in general obligation bonds that's still to be issued. Um, we will come up with a plan for that, but primarily one of the ideas was either to acquire existing affordable rental units that may be on the verge of converting to market. Um, and so trying to find those areas that they haven't already increased the prices up so high um, is one that we are working with um, THDA, the State Housing Finance Agency, to find out if there are any properties that they have that may be expiring soon that we may be able to um, acquire. The Voluntary Inclusionary Zoning and Housing Incentives Program is now at 1.75 million and we have developers who are very interested in this program and call constantly about how can they make the financing work. So um, I know we have a meeting set up um, that's coming up Friday with in, in partnership with the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. The whole idea behind that is to work with developers um, to make sure that they understand how to do their financing, um, answer questions, ask questions related to mixed income development. Um, I've kind of gone into the Metro-owned properties. Um, the pilot program for the low-income housing tax credit program has been very successful. Over 1,000 units have either are, are either underway or under construction or preserved through that program. So currently, uh, over 1,900 affordable and workforce housing units are under construction, preserved, or underway. Kind of what I just said, just in table format, and it's really small, so I won't go there. Um, just so you know, there are one, two, three, three different plans that are coming out that will have some housing implication in it. The community needs evaluation, which comes out every year. The HUD consolidated planning process will be starting soon, and I think Angie Hubbard and MDHA is planning to talk more in depth with council members about what that process looks like. That is the five-year plan for how federal funding will work in Nashville-Davidson County, and it's related to community and affordable housing development. We have created now a housing data resource team, which includes planning, Metro Social Services, MDHA, um, the Metro Homelessness Commission, just to make sure that we are aligning our data and our efforts. It does not make sense for all of us to be doing all these different plans when we probably could share data um, and report that data out. So those are things that we're, we're having constant conversations about and really just kick that off. Um, but we're really excited about what can happen with that. And I will say that um, the other piece to that is Re Resilient Nashville. Um, that strategy will be coming soon, and maybe Eric Cole can talk a little bit more about that, but that may also include some um, housing strategy work in there as well. So uh, leaving it at that and leaving, seeing that there um, are 
six of you left if you have any questions about or have any commentary about what we might be missing I think would be very helpful for us um, and also would like to just hear your feedback and input on um, ways that we can make sure that the Housing Nashville report is um, reflective of also your feedback. Um, thanks. Uh, what, what I'd like to do is, uh, I, I think I'm going to try to ask some quick, easy to answer questions, and uh, then I'm going to open it up to the group, and then I, I would like the committee, those of us who are here, to have a brief discussion afterwards about what we might have on our minds for uh, legislative agenda. Um, so I'm going to try to ask uh, short, easy questions um, <laughs> just to move it along. For the um, the $25 million in GEO bonds, what's, what's the timing you're thinking of for proposing something? I would like to say before the end of the year, I'd love to have something back to you as to some ideas that have been floated around. So I would say, I would hope by the end of the year. All right, and for community land trust, which is on the list, what's your sense of the timing on that? Um, so with the last round of the Barnes Fund, there was a request for interest from um, nonprofit organizations interested in partnering with the city, and we did receive proposals, and I think um, that'll be going to the commission soon um, for discussion and approval and looking at Morgan for the night. Um, so th um, that then will be a recommendation from the Housing Trust Fund Commission, and I don't think that would require council action because I think the next steps would be um, really figuring out who can do some of the technical assistance, how can we make sure that Grounded Solutions Network is able to work with that nonprofit organization. I'm gonna pull a lawyer move on you. So, um, <laughs> give, me, give us a timeline, like when you would think you'd be back saying, yay, mission accomplished, we did it. On community land trust? Yeah. Uh, probably in the next year, maybe. I think the one thing is um, Morgan Mansa um, is planning to um, go to the Community Land Trust Conference so that she can learn more about what this actually means with the partnership of the city and the CLT. I think there are a couple nonprofits that are also planning to attend that conference. And I mean, it requires quite a bit of stewardship and lift from both the city as well as the nonprofit. And so we just want to make sure that we're all understanding what that might mean as an option moving forward. So, so I'm gonna say about, I, I really don't know, but maybe six to nine months. To have it accomplished? Well, to at least um, be able to say if we're gonna move forward with the solid partnership or if we should be looking at another alternative. So when, when do you think it would be good for us to get an update? It's six months? I would say six months. All right, and uh, on the uh, housing incentive pilot program, um, have that have the developers who are interested been more in the converting existing units or building new units? Uh, converting existing. Um, one of the challenges that we had, to be honest with you, um, is the median household income. So one developer had new units um, that he wanted to do for teacher housing. And the teacher housing, um, the incomes that teachers usually have is between forty-two and forty-nine thousand dollars a year. The median household incomes that we're currently using for Davidson County, a one person at one hundred twenty percent median household income, the the cap was thirty-eight thousand. So that was one of those where the, the developer wanted to provide housing units for forty-two to forty-nine thousand, um, but the the teachers would be over income um, for that particular program and so they decided not to proceed and that's why you saw last time a withdrawal um, but there are some um, developers who have new construction deals that have called um, to express interest in new construction um, and then I, I guess the uh, two more for me um, you, you, you talked about of course we all know that uh, the housing and transit costs once it starts getting up to you mentioned 50% it becomes unbearable and uh, I know there's limited options for funding transit but do you have any thoughts about the impact of increasing sales tax on what we're trying to do with affordability 
I do not have any thoughts on that. I have not thought of that as a potential, so I don't have any thoughts on that one. All right. Well, one thing to consider is uh, if we raise tail sales tax, then you know that's a extra percent out of everybody's pocket on pretty much everything they spend, um, and it's got some impact that we ought to be prepared to talk about. Um, and then last question um, before I turn it over to my colleagues is, do you anticipate, um, what, in, what legislation do you anticipate bringing to us, um, if any, in the next three to six months? Certainly the barn spring innovation round will be coming within the next month. Um, and then um, anything related to, <coughs> excuse me, the housing incentives pilot program, we, we hope to have some coming in fairly regularly. Um, so over the next three months, you'll see barns, you'll see housing incentives pilot program, but you hopefully will see something related to um, geo bonds and property tax abatement. So there are four things. All right, thank you. Um, Council Lady Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Got, got a couple of questions. So back to the, the barns fund. Um, how how long is the affordability built into those as it's currently set up? 20 years for home ownership. I'm sorry, I keep looking at Morgan because I've, kinda, <laughs> um, but it's 20 years for affordability for home ownership and 15, is it for rental as well? 20 for rental and home ownership, 20 gotcha. years. And so if someone is living in a house and gets a great job and is able to move on, do they sell at exactly what they bought it for? Is there a shared equity mechanism being set up so that they could rec realize some benefit but still keep it affordable? How, does, how would that work? They basically have to sell it to an income qualified home, home buyer. Um, and so they, it, the deed restrictions, and we're, we're working through that, um, but essentially it is on a resale provision where they would have to sell it to the next income qualified buyer. Gotcha, so that keeps it affordable. And it's, basically it's a restrictive covenant that runs with the, the property. For that, for that period of time. And if the community land trust was set up, then that could be a partner in that process and perhaps build in longer affordability and, and a shared equity mechanism so it could be 99 years or something. Is that possible? From my understanding, the maximum is 30 years 30. with the option to renew. And I'm looking at maybe the real estate attorneys in the room, but my understanding the state law, is, uh, it says 30 years, and I think you might be able to write in some automatic or, or auto renewal every 30 years to keep it affordable. Okay, that, that's encouraging. But you're right, They're, the nonprofit, if they purchase that property, um, if they were a CLT, they would just keep it affordable over time. Gotcha. Yeah, that seems like a, a great thing to be pursuing. And then I, I, I keep hearing about real estate investment trusts being another mechanism that can provide equity. Is that something that exists here or that we can tap in from other cities or there is, a, there is not one that I know of that is available now, but there is some interest for sure in um, increasing that. And one of the things they've mentioned to us is they would need some upfront equity to build in support from the private community that would also uh, kind of be investing into that real estate investment trust. Right. So that would be upfront equity from Metro that we then could build this real estate investment trust. And that would be like a social enterprise investment for people that are okay making a lower return for what would be a very stable investment, right? Low risk. Mm -hmm. um, That's right. I know, I know there's some interest in doing that. I'd love to, to see that happen. Um, on the hip of that 1.75 million that's out there, um, in theory, our inclusionary zoning bill is, is live and happening now. So does that come from that same pot? Um, yes. And have you gotten some of those as well? We have not yet. We have had calls who the council member has encouraged them to give us a call. So mm -hmm. we've had some of those where um, the zone, they may not have applied for the zoning yet. They just kind of want to hear how the program worked. But yes, there will be some. Okay. So that I think that's, I'm glad that's happening. Um, I think that was all I wanted to know at this point. Thank you so much for what you're doing and let, let us know how we can keep supporting you. Thank you. All right, Councilman Hastings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I just have uh, two questions for you. Uh, I know that uh, with the nonprofit providers who are building right now, 
Um, they're doing a really good job, and uh, we say thanks to all of those guys. Uh, but also in the way, I wanted to uh, see, you know, I know there was a process this past year in budget time uh, that we looked at as far as the uh, all the funds went to certain uh, nonprofit producers. Uh, the first thing is seeing how, what is the mechanism that we're going to go by this time to make sure that didn't, that doesn't happen again, and to make sure that we are we're doing a fair uh, process with that program. Uh, and then also, uh, I know we talked about Metro Own Land. You know, I'm really keen on that because I I have a lot of it in, in my district, as you know. But uh, we were looking, there are other areas and we're trying to put uh, affordable housing into all, all, all areas. As you know, there's Metro School that is going to be moving, uh, that is in the, the Hillwood and the Bellmead area. Uh, we need to diversify and make sure that we have affordable housing into all areas. You know, I know uh, a lot of people may not want to talk about that, but we need to. Uh, and to see what is the cluster of some of the things that, that you guys are looking at to see how we can make that happen. Thank you. I will answer um, the, there is a cap on the Barnes funding right now where a nonprofit um, with this current round can only receive $2 million at one time. So that, that cap is a part of the application process as, um, as written. Um, and just to talk about the Metro owned property, we have um, through the alignment Nashville, we've been talking a lot about how Metro MN, MNPS property could be used. And I think they are looking at their property saying, well, there is this population growth, do we really need to be letting go of you know older schools because there may be an increase in population? And so we've we've had quite a bit of discussion about um, MMPS properties. Um, and you're absolutely right. We would love if every council member, every um, constituency, uh, would raise their hand and say yes in my backyard. Um, the reality is we are getting um, quite a bit of not in my backyard. And so the more that we can make sure that we have affordable and workforce housing um, in all of the districts, I think is incredibly important. Um, that's the only way we're gonna get to this housing diversity um, and mixed income communities um, that we want. Hello? Okay, um, one other thing that we did for Barnes is that we added a small nonprofit, small project set aside for this fall round. Um, we recognize that there are a lot of smaller nonprofits or um, groups that are you know, connected to churches or nonprofits that may be large but are fairly new to developing affordable housing. And so if their budget is um, $500,000 or less, then they don't have to compete with the extremely large nonprofits every round um, because they may not be able to leverage the same amount of money as those nonprofits. Profits. They may not have 15 years of experience and things like that. And so with that set aside, they compete with nonprofits that are similar in size and similar with project size um, in the hopes that that will help to diversify um, the pool too. And um, even just with the efforts that we've done um, internally with programming and things like that, this has been the most diverse round, which we will bring to y'all um, on October 17th that we've seen so far for Barnes. Um, diverse in terms of a lot of new nonprofits who were awarded funding. Um, a lot new, a lot of new um, populations, special populations that we're serving. Then also in terms of the geography around Nashville, um, a lot of calls we'll be doing this week to council members who we previously haven't called before, um, which we're really excited about. So we're continuing to do that. Um, we met with the Minority Caucus earlier this year, and we're really responsive to some of the questions and recommendations that they had. And so it's it's come to fruition through the um, results of the recommendations this round. Go ahead. Uh, just one, one other quick question. Yeah. On the scoring that you guys have, have you guys looked at that and uh, see that, you know, if there's a better way to get that done? Because I know one of the uh, scoring that you get a bigger score on how many people that you're able to house. And uh, one of the things that I feel that there's an issue with that is because we have a lot of uh, producers that may be doing the uh, uh, a rental of rooms in a particular home, 
and that doesn't necessarily fit, f fix the long-term issue. So I was just wondering if that was a, a place that you guys are looking at as well. Um, so for the innovation round and for this round that's live right now, we don't award based on the number of units. So you don't receive additional points for that. So we completely agree with you on that. And um, one other thing that we tweaked too is that we noticed a lot of the smaller nonprofits, or maybe not small, but newer groups may not have the capacity to pay for an audit every year. And so one way that we tweak the scoring is that you can receive partial funding for your financial statements instead of your audit. Um, of course, we'll still, you know, check in to make sure your financials are where they should be. But um, we, that's one immediate need that we saw was an issue that separated a lot of quality applications um, between one another. It was in that area. And so we are trying to look through the actual scoring, making sure that it's responsive. And so, um, you know, we, we're continuing to make those tweaks. But that's one area in particular, you're right, where um, we saw that there was, there was that gap right there. Mm -hmm. Councilman Sledge. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you, Adrian and Morgan, for the work you're doing. Um, I wanted to follow up on the comments that were made about the commission. Um, I, I haven't been able to sit on it for the last couple of years. I can tell members um, there, there's been a lot of work that's been put in from this office on looking at everything from scoring to funding to the number of organizations and where it's being funded. And Commissioner Bodenhammer, who just rolled off the commission, was very keen on ensuring that there was geographic diversity, and so I'm hopeful this body's gonna see kind of the fruits, quite frankly, of the labor that the commission has worked on in the last couple of years. And that has nothing to do with my work. I've just been impressed by my colleagues on the commission. Um, I did have a couple of questions, Adrian, regarding the, um, one of which was about the GO bonds. Um, I know that, uh, I know you kind of gave a little bit of update of the issuance. Is there, my understanding is those bonds were, are hopefully going to be used primarily to retain um, current affordable housing. Can you speak a little bit about that? And if you have, I know there's monetary figures attached to a lot of these, but I don't know if we've done any work on the hope of how many units we might hope to preserve or retain. Right. Um, that's why we've been working a lot with THDA and trying to figure out how many units they've seen, because they're the ones really that know when projects are expiring. Um, they administer a lot of the tax credits and things like that. So we've been working with them to get an idea of how much these developments are really for sale for um, and trying to figure out how we can partner with them on that. Um, the reason why we've kind of moved to this retention element versus kind of construction is just the fact that we know construction costs are increasing. We hear that all the time. Um, but what we can't get ahead of is this whole conversion to market. So if we are somehow able to um, purchase maybe even some of the smaller 20 unit type um, apartment developments or something like that where Metro, the thing is Metro has to own this property. Metro has to um, own the units. Um, there could be management and maintenance that is um, a fee out of that. But for the most part, this is Metro taking ownership of units, which is not necessarily used to doing. It's usually something that MDHA does. And so we'll have to talk about that kind of ownership um, uh, portion for using the geo bonds. Um, and so we're trying to get around what does that actually mean and making sure that when we present something to you all, you also see the financials of that to make sure that you know that there is at least some return um, to make sure that we're, you know, that we are actually retaining residents, but we're also able to keep this affordable for the next however many years. To that end, we heard from the, some of the apartment association developers last meeting mm -hmm. about qualifying census tracts and sort of the additional funding that they're able to get. Um, is Metro impacted by the potential of us seeing, you know, the next few years, some of these qualifying census tracts no longer qualify? Are we, I guess what I'm really asking, are we up against the time crunch? Um, regarding how long those tracks still qualify? Um, I, I, I don't believe so. I mean, I think the um, as it's taking us a while, it also takes a while for those kinds of changes to happen. Um, and so we think we're kind of tracking along with them as well. Um, the idea here, too, is maybe we need to look at where some of those affordable rentals are that may be um, in areas that are 
naturally occurring so that once they are transitioning or if they transition that we're kind of ahead of the curve um, and so we we are still doing very much our own research um, to figure out exactly what that looks like and how many units that could actually be um, because they know that they can get investors in and make however much it almost has to be a mission oriented owner um, that's um, willing to sell to Metro. And so that's why we're working with some of the federal and state partners to figure out um, how we can kind of get in on some of their processes so that we're the first ones they call um, when they hear of a development that's um, up for sale. Gotcha. Uh, Chair, I've just got one last question. You were putting in the 1900 unit number together. We're not including MDHA's work on Envision projects, are we through that? Well, there may be, like Barrett Manor, for instance, is 70 units of public housing. That's included in that okay. uh, 1900. Um, so like the Casey's and Sudicum Napier. Yeah, we are well. not projecting. Um, and, and keep in mind that with the Envision processes, those are going to be a lot of retention efforts with affordable affordability. There will be increases in workforce. Um, and increases in market, but maybe not as many increases in affordable. Um, and so that's really a retention strategy. Um, so we are, um, I mean, there may be some ways for us to get some additional affordable housing units, but we're also kind of monitoring um, their process. Really the 1900 units is Metro kind of investment or Metro programming. It's, it's kind of outside of um, MDHA's current programs. Thanks, thanks, Drew. Thank you, uh, Councilman Leonardo. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to echo what Councilman Hastings said about really looking hard at vacant metro buildings. I mean, there's a certain zip codes here without naming them that you know that without vacant metro buildings and vacant metro lands, it's probably going to be really difficult to have any kind of, you know, work even workforce housing, much less affordable. So I would be a big proponent of, you know, looking strongly at vacant metro buildings and the like. But and maybe we're getting. Little, maybe I'm getting a little bit ahead here, but I know Councilman Mendez was talking about potential for raising, you know, sales tax, and I wanted to know if, as part of this referendum that's anticipated, is there any is there going to be any appropriation of that money um, for housing? And if you know, I do not know that answer. What I do know is the tax increment financing piece includes affordable and workforce. So that is more so what. What I'm working on is that there will be a financing mechanism for developers to take advantage of. I, I don't know the, the other side of that. Thank you. So, and just a clarification on that. There, it's going to be um, affordable and workforce housing can be associated with a transit-oriented redevelopment district, right? That's right. Not any of the existing redevelopment districts that don't have, that aren't transit-oriented. That's my understanding. And then I wanted to ask one other clarification. The conversation you're having about uh, the GO bonds with Councilman Sledge, um, uh, I'm sure there must be a good reason. Why, why is it that Metro would have to buy as opposed to continuing um, uh, providing incentives to the current, the existing owners? So that's why I mentioned the property tax abatement. That is one way of, um, owners to continue affordability if there was some type of property tax abatement. With the GEO bonds, what we have what we heard was if GEO bonds were used for affordable housing, it's kind of like using GEO bonds for any other public benefit, um, and that's why Metro would have to maintain ownership. I see. Um, all right. Uh, thank you very much. And I, I know it's late, and I know there's only a handful of us, but I would like to just uh, get a quick um, go around if anybody's got a uh, suggestion about uh, legislation related to affordable housing that they'd really like us to be focused on so we could um, maybe uh, over the coming months have a, a specific direction that we're, um, we're rowing. And so I'll throw it out to the group. I see Mr. Hastings. Uh, we have to get the for-profit entity involved in this system. Uh, we have talked about it for a long time. The for-profit would like to play a part into this game. We have to do that this time. Uh, there is no way that we're going to get above and beyond to catch up to the speed of the city if we do not have all hands on deck. 
That is the main suggestion that I would put out there. Not saying that the nonprofit entities are not doing a great job. There's just no way that we can keep up with the speed. Because, again, there are other people that are in, our, in my district, per se, who, who are working, who are doing the best that they can, but cannot find adequate housing and being able to find, afford the living that is, is on track right now in my community. It is ridiculous. So for profit, we have to bring them apart. Got it on the list. Uh, anybody else? I know it's late. Councilor Lee Allen. So I'm, I'm relying on Adrian to sort of help us figure out what, what we need laws for and what is kind of covered by just getting the nonprofits um, empowered and, and scaled up. We, we, we talked about the Real Estate Investment Trust. Is that something that requires legislative support somewhere, or is that, again, just bringing the right partners together and we just support you on that? Or is there legislation that would be needed for that? Well, what they've said to us is we, we would need some upfront capital. capital. Um, so, I mean... And who is they? Uh, we, we've heard from um, a local entity who's interested in kind of expanding um, and looking into this mm -hmm. um, that already works with a lot of private financial institutions mm -hmm. um, that they feel like if they were just to get a bit of Metro support, that other private financial institutions would be willing to. Gotcha. Um, so is that another bond issue, or could that be part of that $25 million bond issue? Or Well, and the, again, that bond issuance would be either the hard construction or the renovation of existing units gotcha. where Metro would own it. So I don't know if that issuance would actually work for capital, you know, just okay. to give um, as capital. So we would have to investigate and see. Um, if that's an option. What but the I, options are. I think okay. it's outside of that. Okay. I mean, that, that seems like something we should at least be keeping an eye on to, to continue to keep happening. All right. Thanks. I got it on the list. Councilman Sledge. Uh, I wanted to echo Councilman Hazing's comments. I think it's absolutely imperative we're getting the for-profit um, sector involved in this. And one of the things that came to mind is, I guess, and this could be administrative or it could be legislative, um, how are we essentially removing hurdles um, from in the development process that if there is a commitment to uh, providing a percentage of affordable housing, and I don't know if there's a rubric we develop, but it's more or less front of line legislation that your, yeah, your expedited permits, your expedited, that, that we're incentivizing in a way without really putting up money per se, but so folks know that they can get the capital out there faster. Um, so. That's sort of either front of line or best builder sort of work. All right, thank you. And Council Lady Henderson. Thank you, Chair Mendez. I do not serve on this committee, but I appreciate being able to listen in. And thank you, Ms. Harris, for all your good work. Um, I would just uh, mention as it relates to legislation, and I know the planning department is beginning to think about this but that we continue to consider to what extent our parking minimums make uh, development uh, so expensive. Um, and when we have transportation-oriented development um, uh, that we're looking at uh, reducing our parking minimums potentially. Um, I know we don't even have parking minimums downtown, but we continue to build parking and that's kind of related to market demands and so forth. But just. Um, keeping that parking piece, I guess, is part of the um, uh, affordable housing uh, conversation and when and if possible, um, looking at that from a legislative perspective in um, Title 17. All right, thank you. Um, any thoughts on any of those? Um, I would just say that uh, the reason why we partnered with the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta for this event um, is really so that um, the private development community could hear it from a third party. They've been researching other cities. Um, and so this is their opportunity to provide even some land use um, implications as well as some financial implications that could help with mixed income development. And I will say that the response to this event has been incredible. We did not expect such an overwhelming response. Um, and so we are recording that forum. We will have it on YouTube. Um, we will have a, ha a has hashtag of housing Nash. So 
So we apologize um, for not having the space enough to accommodate everybody, um, but we really wanna make sure that we have development community and we thank you to some of the council members who've already um, said that they will be there. We just wanna make sure that um, the Fed is able to answer any of those questions and we can get to some of these kind of actionable strategies. So we'll continue this dialogue about mixed income developments um, over the next few months. All right, thanks very much. Um, to all of you who came today, thanks. Um, you know, I've, this is my first meeting as a chair of the Affordable Housing Committee. As we go forward through this next year, feel free to reach out by telephone or email. Let me know what's on your mind. Um, I think uh, we're going to try to have a renewed focus. Over the last year, we had a lot of information gathering sessions, which has been great. Uh, but I think the focus over the next year is uh, um, uh, what, what can we do? What roadblocks can we get rid of? And um, uh, I would like to do more of what we've done today get precise about what we can accomplish, what roadblocks we need to get rid of, and, and act toward doing that. So thanks a lot for sticking around to 710 on a Monday. Thanks, Adrian. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.